So we've had a lot of great episodes of podcasts over the years, but uh, I think the one that you're going to listen to today, um, gosh, this will this will be uh, life changing if you listen to what Dan Nelson has to say. Dan Nelson is the director of Mission 43. Uh, we talk a lot about that in this podcast. Um, he uh, graduated from Centennial High School. He was the UCLA football team captain from two, 2004 to six. Former U.S. Army Special Forces officer in Green Beret. Um, served overseas um, on several tours, uh, was wounded in combat in 2017, and uh, is a Purple Heart recipient. Um, I did not know uh, where we were going when we started the conversation with Dan. I know him well, but um, this is an episode that I think uh, certainly changed me. Uh, I hope you enjoy, and uh, at the end of it, I think you'll have a greater appreciation for this wonderful country we live in and uh, the people who fight uh, for our freedom. Uh, so enjoy uh, Dan Nelson. For those who don't know, uh, Dan Nelson, and I have a little intro before we, we get into this, but director of Mission 43, but but this Friday, I think I'm doing my fourth year. It is your fourth year, yeah, for our Leaders Fellowship. So you guys do a Leaders Fellowship. So you talk a little bit about it. You get how many how many cohort or in the cohort? We're finishing up. You'll be speaking to cohort five this year, and then we're already working on interviewing for cohort six. So it'll be the sixth year of the program coming up here soon. And tell, tell us a little bit about the program, and then I'm going to tell you how I'm going to get back at you. <laughs> well, it could be... I don't know. For us, it's one of our pride and joy things. Like Mission 43 as an organization, you know, meant for military veterans and, you know, military spouses as well, you know, are pretty inclusive. There's a low bar to entry, but there are some programs that have a high bar of entry, and Leaders Fellowship is one of those. We have about 96 fellows statewide and honestly countrywide right now, and uh, that's about to, that's not counting the sixth cohort that's just coming in. The fellowship does all kinds of things, everything from uh, getting people out in the wilderness and experiencing some uh, lead yourself first type of solitude. Uh, and then what you're talking about, I think, is our phase three, where every month they meet with different community pillar leaders, uh, you being one of those for the past four years. And we come and grill you and ask all my stupid questions, and you have to talk to our group. So what happens is the very first time I did it, you're like, hey, come come do this for me. I'm like, hey, I'll do anything. What, what do you need me to do? And I said, how, how, you know, what time do you want me to show up? And you're like, hey, uh, you come at noon and you'll be done by five. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? But it's a, it's a, it's a you know, fireside chat. It's a fireside chat. Yeah. You're not just talking the whole time by no. yourself where you sit and it's really wonderful. I love it. It's one of the, one of my favorite things to do, but anyway, that's Friday and you're going to be asking me questions. So the timing of this is really good. Thank you're you. You're the closer this year, by the way. Oh, Tom. I am. You are. Good yeah. Part. We've had Muffy Davis, Lisa Grow, uh, Todd Lindsay, Bill Whitaker, Roger Quarles. We've had everybody there and you're the closer oh, this year. Wow. No pressure. Nope. No, no. Um, thank you for coming on today. No, oh, I'm hard I have, to be here. I've known you for several years, mm -hmm. and um, I've known some of your story. I've heard the story told by others, but I think it's going to be super awesome today for our listeners. We have a pretty wide group of folks that listen to this, business leaders and community members, but... I you must be doing a lot of these because you're scraping the bottom of the barrel for guests, obviously, and we're sitting here now, but yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. So I, I want to I want to dig a little deeper because I've I've um, you know I know the work you do now, but you have an incredible story, Dan. Like a, a wild story. It's Forrest Gump, but not as entertaining, I think. Yeah, it is Forrest Gump. <laughs> Actually, that's a great title for this, Matty. This, no. this is the Forrest Gump episode. It, it, it is. Well, because I was in the military and I was Lieutenant Dan for quite an amount of years as a. Uh, and uh, bitter about changing my career. There's a lot of apt comparisons other than I still have my both natural legs, I guess. But. <laughs> but, if I, but if I just started this, and then we'll get deeper, and I said, hey, you know, Centennial High School, so yep. local kid. Go Patriots. UCLA football captain. Yeah. Green Beret. Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. And then you went through some tough times, and now director of Mission 43. Yeah. It's a wild freaking ride. Uh, it's still still on the ride, right? It's not over yet, but yeah, it's been a been a road, something I couldn't have planned, right? But there's some opportunities, like the one I'm in now, that you cannot really plan for. I don't think, like, I don't think there's any training or specific education that would 
prepare someone to work for the Jay and Catherine Albertson Family Foundation, you know, in this role, leading Mission 43, their veterans initiative. I don't know if that, you know, I don't know if there's any degree or certificate in philanthropy or veteran services or community services that would prepare someone for that. I just feel very honored and lucky to do it. Let me, let me, I'm going to start with the end and then have you rewind and tell your story. So <laughs> okay. this is what I know. So um, Joe Scott, um, so Joe is uh, um, the heir of the Albertsons family um, fortune. Um, he started the uh, JK uh, family, it's fa family foundation now, yeah. right? They changed the name a little bit. JCAF, yeah. JCAF. Um, and they have done wonderful things for a long, long time. Yeah. But what I've heard, and I've heard it from a few sources, is that a lot of a lot of Joe's dollars went into trying to fix and help with education in Idaho. That's true. And it was a hard, you know, it's a hard slog, right? Yeah. How do you change something that doesn't want to be changed? And I think there was a little bit of frustration there. And then I've heard from Roger, we've had him on, that Joe stuck his head in this door one day and said, what are we doing for veterans? <laughs> yeah. And Roger's like, why, Joe? And he's like, we need to do more. And out of that first discussion grew Mission 43. Yeah. So, so that's an incredible story. It but is. But then I've heard Joe tell your story a few times. And um, listen, I, I honestly, like, I've lived a lot of life and, and like, incredible human beings I've ever known in my life. Yep. Joe Scott's top of the list for me. The guy is unbelievable. No joke. But when he starts talking about you, he gets tears in his eyes and he talks about a guy when he first met you, and I'll let you tell the thing, but you were not in a great spot, right? No, definitely not. And he'll say, you know, just kind of, you know, and you can talk, I, I want to hear where you were, but then something that's near and dear to my heart now, because we're doing this together, you had some hyperbaric therapy. Yep. So, so take me to that point, meeting Joe, and then, and then I just want to hear why and how, man, because we're going to go help some people. Yeah. We're going to make a difference. And, and, and the fact that you're leading it and you're a guy that went through it, it's powerful. Well, I can take zero credit for getting to this point where the field house and summit hyperbarics have gotten or mission 43, even honestly, um, I didn't start mission 43. Like you said, that's how it started where Mr. Scott, Joe Scott came to Roger Corals and said, what are we doing for veterans? And then the family looked for ways to do it. And I think in their research, they found that the majority of veterans resource programs, you know, VSOs, but, or whatever you want to call them, especially in the nonprofit landscape, they go to like the, the 10 percent that were actually like wounded in combat right now i'm i'm part of that 10 percent but it's probably a smaller number than that right like all these resources are directed to the wounded warriors and people that are struggling and it's like you know what there's a bunch of veterans and military spouses out there that served their country proudly and just by you know roll the dice they didn't get injured in combat or even see combat and now they're coming back and trying to do some really great things in our community how do we empower them and how can we make a veterans organization that's aspirational and not just giving handouts to somebody, you know? And there's like that dichotomy too. There's either, you know, civilians that are really uh, disaffected by the military culture because we don't have a draft, right? So it's like less than 1% of our country is serving. So a lot of civilians either picture veterans, um, like potentially in the workforce as people that are great leaders. And I'm here to tell you that that's not necessarily true. It doesn't matter if you're a colonel or a sergeant or a captain, like that does not automatically hold you as, you know, make you a great leader. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that we're all broken, right? Or in some way dangerous, we're mm. a threat. We all have PTSD or something like that. And that's not true either, mm. right? The truth as always, or most times lies somewhere in the middle. And especially with military spouses being included in this, you have people that are constantly managing projects, whether it's leading a family through 10 permanent change of duty station moves throughout the entire world and whatnot. But back to your question. I, well, I know that, but I love, just I want to hit on that. Yeah. I love the fact that it includes spouses. Yeah, it's very rare. It, yeah. It's very rare, and, it, and it's so integral to even when I do my talks with you guys every year, mm -hmm. there are spouses in that audience, and it just was one of the first things that struck me. I'm like, well, that makes total sense. They were along for the entire ride, and they're part of this deal. Anyway, keep going. No, it's definitely a harder job than I ever did. Um, well, so in 2017, it was August 16, 2017, is, uh, well, I got blown up. It was a mass casualty situation in a place called Momon Valley in southern Nangahar, which is a province in Afghanistan. 
Uh, it was a counter ISIS mission. We were fighting ISIS-K or Khorasan province. I know a lot of people don't think that there's ISIS in Afghanistan, but there certainly was and is. And we had spent the entire summer and part of the spring clearing other adjacent valleys until that point. Long story short, um, we were in. So when you say clearing valleys, you're, you're, you're actively going and trying to find and root out ISIS in. That was my seventh deployment. And it was very unique because anyone that grew up in the GWAT or the Global War on Terror deploys and fights counterinsurgency. Okay. So you're you know, like, you have to discriminate between civilians and bad guys, right? Well, this trip was different. Uh, civilians left these valleys because they were being tortured, um, because they were being brutalized by ISIS. And they had not been touched by any coalition forces in years. So ISIS-K had this unfettered access to this area. And these three valleys, uh, Pekka, Momond, and Kot Valley in particular, and uh, ISIS-K took over those groups, or took over those valleys. And we, my team was tasked with clearing Pekka Valley. And we started in April, and we cleared it by June. My team and another uh, sister team did it together with a bunch of enablers and a lot of folks. Um, and that was very kinetic. It wasn't my first rodeo, I guess, as far as combat deployments, but it was just a really unique situation. They call it force on force, where you're living there. You don't go in and out. There's not period of darkness missions, which is very common in my past of past deployments where you'd go, you know, hit a target and then come home. The strike force thing. Right. 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 This was different. Uh, it was very different. And, um, yeah, there, uh, when we had success in one valley, we were asked to do another valley, which was Momon Valley. We started about five in the morning, local time there, and uh, we're in contact about 30 minutes after we started, and it was a constant firefight and rolling tick, or troops in contact, as they call it, uh, up until about 5 p.m. that night. Uh, there was one reinforced concrete structure. It actually was an abandoned mosque. Um, we needed to establish a RON site, which is a rest overnight site. And uh, that was my decision as the GFC, the ground force commander, um, to occupy that building. And uh, that's where we were gonna create our first stronghold for the night before we started clearing further into the valley. Um, we were there for uh, almost 30 minutes and then there was a massive explosion and that explosion injured 31 Americans. It killed six Afghans and one uh, of my teammates named Aaron Butler. He was the youngest guy on my team. Hmm. And um, that started a U-shaped ambush where basically it was a trap, right? So they wanted us to go in that building, we did, and then uh, things kicked off from there. So it took uh, quite a bit of time. A lot of my guys were, um, because of that and what they did both before uh, the explosion, during the explosion, and after the explosion that day, the, you know, three of my guys were awarded the Silver Star, which is the third highest award for valor that our country can give. And then my Air Force CCT, Dan Keller, who's also an Idahoan, uh, was uh, awarded the Air Force Cross, which is uh, only below the Medal of Honor, and he deserves every bit of it, as do they. And... Uh, it was a tough one. So that wasn't the first time I'd had a TBI. It wasn't the first time um, been blown up um, or anything like that, but it was the last time and ended up, um, you know, having me uh, medically evacuated from the country. And then I spent some time at Walter Reed, which is actually where my second son, um, my youngest son was born. So um, before you go on, man, that's, that's, that's just heavy. Yeah. It's not kind of I'm not built to deal with that stuff all the time, right? I know you guys go through a lot of training, but how do you process one the responsibility and then two just you know we're all we're all humans and have this capacity to love and care or you know and I can only imagine the brotherhood you have with those men that you're with there. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little about that. I think brotherhood is something that's often talked about and to me it's extremely important uh, and it's honestly hard to explain but if I could boil it down it would be um, a responsibility hmm. it's a weight where you're saying and believing to the core of your being that if we are brothers in this like your well-being and safety is more important than my own 
Um, and that is a burden that you have to morally um, accept. And as the commander of that ODA or Special Forces Detachment of that mission, of that uh, ground force, as we're moving through, you know, I'm legally and morally obligated for all of their well-being. And uh, I have made, at that point in my career, a lot of decisions. And people had definitely, uh, yeah, well, people have been hurt because of my decisions, right? And um, good people. And there's also a lot of bad people that got hurt because of my decisions. And you could take that either way. I don't know. Some people end up feeling guilty and other ones don't. I don't know. But what I do feel is the weight of soldiers that, um, of people whose lives are changed, and even the guys that didn't die um, that are still alive, their lives have been forever altered. And particularly in that one instance, there's a lot of lives, a lot of careers that got ended. And I don't mean fired in a bad way. I mean, they're medically discharged because a lot of my guys got hurt um, and have struggled. And, you know, I'm in a place now where I'm, I'm not at all a, a person to talk to veterans and say like, hey, like, I'm familiar with your struggles and do what I did so you'll be better because I'm not better. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I'm still in it and it's a constant. It, it never, never, never leaves. I don't know if it can. Yeah. Like, I mean, how are you supposed to say that, especially if someone that's legally morally obligated for other people's lives to say like, well, get over it. You know, you have to move on. It's true. You do have to move on and continue living to some extent, right? But it would be disrespectful to alleviate oneself from that burden. Mm. And people say, well, it's guilt or survivor's guilt or whatever. The fact is there are people inside that building and even my guys that were on the outside, the ones that got hurt, it sounds like Hollywood BS, but like I'm the person that survived from inside the building. Um, and, uh, you know, um, and you know, it's, it's a process to go through. Uh, I could talk about Aaron Butler all day long because he was the type of uh, dude that's like, we had a team of pretty meat eating people uh, for lack of a better term. And he made, you know, he made us all come look like vegans. He was just that type of guy. And no he, offense to he, vegans. He's from Idaho. No, no. Uh, Aaron's from Utah, Monticello, Utah. Oh. He was a four-time state wrestling champ hmm. uh, before he joined the service and decided he wanted to be a Green Beret. So um, just an all-around badass type of dude. And uh, uh, his family's still down there in southern Utah. And anyway, I think the combination of how things happened, and maybe it was a buildup, uh, or maybe it's karma because I was a, I was a – Honestly, I was a non-believer at that point in my life in PTSD in TBIs, even to a large extent, because like, I mean, from boxing and college football and, you know, being in airborne units and going on combat rotations, like the dings and concussions, as yeah. we used to call it, on the head. Yeah. I mean, I'd been sick. I'd been thrown up, you know, thrown up before you sleep it off and then you go back to work, you know, so now everything is a TBI, right? And I'm not making light of that. So, so just so everyone's so TBI, traumatic brain injury, traumatic brain injury, and post traumatic post -traumatic stress stress disorder, yeah. right? So, so real things. Everyone's heard of them before, sure. but but here you've got this history of football, boxing, yeah. you know, team captain, UCLA, Green Beret, and you go through this horrible thing. That 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 is, you know, Dan. I mean, I'm sitting here. I'm just sitting here thinking a couple things. One, it's super emotional because of someone who didn't serve but loves this country. I don't, th I mean, I think a lot of times you probably hear, hey, thank you for your service kind of a deal. But, I mean, how can someone that didn't do that or experience that ever really express gratitude for what you were risking and doing? So it's, 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 it, it's probably, it's just, it's, it's overwhelming to think about what you uh, sacrificed for our country. And so, so that, that's one. And then two, um, Gosh, um, I, I'm just sitting here as you're telling your story, and I'm thinking of Joe. Mm. Because I want to, I want you to go to the next part of the yeah. story where he. So you, you're not in a good spot. No, no. I spent months in Walter Reed, uh, which is the medical center that a lot of people get evacuated to stateside once they're injured overseas. Um, 
I had a lot of issues, but the name one was the traumatic brain injury. Um, my, my speech was affected. My vision was affected. Um, a lot of those things, and it's weird in a hospital environment because it's so canned, I didn't even realize, which makes me feel really dumb looking back at it. But I didn't recognize how I was, but I recognized people's reactions to me, even people that knew me. And it was just hard and it made me mad. And I just like, I was, I was a miserable person. So I'm sure somebody will listen to this that may have been around in that area, known just patient Nelson at that point. And they probably like that guy, what a bad person. And they're probably right. Cause I, I don't know. Cause I have all these things missing. I have memories of pieces of it. And then I have memories like of the 16th, August 16th, 2017 that I've seen from people's helmet cams, I've seen aerial footage, I've seen those things, but it's all mixed up. So now it's hard for me to tell even what's my memories and what's the memories of other people. But what I remember is <laughs> waking up at Walter Reed and still being in the mindset that I was in. And I was a very, very unpleasant person to be around. And I'm sure they had amazing uh, people that were willing to help me and I was not at all willing to accept help, right? So. Eventually, I was sent home uh, here. Like I said, my youngest son was born there, so now I have like a one and a half year old and a newborn that my wife was fully taken care of uh, by herself because I'm a vegetable lump, you know, um, uh, an angry one at that. And then, um, you know, things were not going well for me. So my wife actually was, <laughs> I guess, desperate at the time because uh, we were trying to get help from all these different places. And there's a lot of well-meaning organizations out there that were reaching out and they're like, hey man, like you're from Idaho, do you wanna go hunting on this free cool trip to British Columbia? Or do you wanna go deep water fishing off Florida? And don't get me wrong, I love doing that stuff. I had no desire to do that. I wanna, you know, like that was not the time and place. Like I, I don't wanna go hunting, no. Like I wanna be able to go up my stairs. Hmm. I wanna be able to read a book to my kids. Hmm. Like that's what I wanted. Um, selfishly and then I felt um you know dealing with the the guilt of something um I don't know if guilt is the right word dealing with the burden that comes with unfortunately you know the truth is and everyone can boil it down and believe me I've worked with lots of psychologists and everyone else under the sun to boil it down to something different but the real truth is my last act as a as a military leader was basically walking my guys into a trap and not all of them came out um and I don't say that because I want pity or anything like that. I'm just trying to call a spade a spade. That's what happened. And um, so in my wife's reaching out to different groups, uh, she reached out to a group of uh, spouses of SF guys or Special Forces guys, Green Berets. Um, and they're like, well, this one lady is in Idaho. Like, why don't you connect? That one lady happened to be, you know, the wife of a, another SF guy who was temporarily here in Idaho, also involved in Mission 43. And then um, that's how she first heard about Mission 43. And she's like, hey, we're gonna, I'm gonna take you to this happy hour event. I'm like, I have no desire to go to any veterans group stuff at this point, because I've been jaded, you know, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't want people to hand me a check. I don't want people to take me fishing. I don't want people to do the veterans petting zoo type of thing and thank me for my service. I'm not talking about that yet, but. <laughs> and, and that's how I, first came to Mission 43, basically. I got drugged there or bribed there at the promise of maybe a free beer or something like that. And then I met people and that led me to be introduced uh, to the Scott family and, and the Albertson Family Foundation. And I wasn't doing that well at the time. And if I could take one sec too, you asked me like, how do you thank someone? Uh, and certainly not someone like me, cause I'm still here um, and very lucky and doing all the things. So, uh, to me, and it's probably not a really popular answer, but if like how civilians or just any American, whether they served or not, like how you can truly show respect and gratitude for those that have sacrificed at any capacity is live a worth, like live a life worth dying for. Mm. Like that's it. Like be a citizen, mm. be an active American. If you're lucky enough to be an American in this country, like mm. take it seriously and live a life worth their sacrifice. Wow. That's powerful. That's my half assed opinion at least. But well, I've never I've never heard it said that way and that's incredible. Um so Joe will tell you with tears in his eyes 
He meets you. You have yeah. dark sunglasses on. Yeah. You're not a terribly pleasant guy at that time. <laughs> yeah. Not looking, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> and and he, Joe, had been introduced to this idea of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Now, as yeah. so I'm an ER doctor, and we actually worked very closely with hyperbarics because of the ER. And yeah. for years, as everyone knows, hyperbaric wound therapy, hyperbarics yeah. for a whole bunch of things. There's a whole list of things that are medically proven where if you dive, and that's the term that they use, mm -hmm. where you go under pressured um, uh, pressure with then oxygen therapy, that those, that'll those that be healing to the tissues and it drives it into those tissues and works really well. We know that for lots of things. One thing that it's never been proven to help or paid for to help mm. is uh, TBI, right? Brain tissue. Brain tissue. It can so, heal tissue everywhere else. So it's how, not the brain. How in the hell it can heal your heel, you know, your, on your foot, but it wouldn't help your brain. So none of it makes, right? right? But they won't pay for it. So here comes Joe and his family, and they send you to do how many dives? I did 60 dives at Idaho Hyperbarics in Pocatello, Idaho. Yeah, 60 dives. Mm -hmm. So you do the dives. He's sending people around different locations because we don't have that capability here. Well, at that time, that was not, I think it was just a desperation thing. I don't yeah. think they had any intent, at least to my knowledge, still, I don't think they had any intent of really deep diving or certainly investing in the way they have yeah. the hyperbaric oxygen treatment or HBOT. Um, it was kind of a, a Hail Mary because I remember, you know, through Mission 43, the Albertson Foundation saying, like, well, what can we do for you? And I remember one, like, one conversation, I'm like, well, I'd love a job. You know, and they're like, no, no, like, what, what could we do for you? And I'm like, I don't want, I don't want anything, you know what I mean? Like, and they're like, well, where can we send you? I'm like, well, I've been here, I've been here, I've been here, I've done this. And there's a lot of factors to this, right? And I'm not speaking ill of any of the programs, either governmental or not. There's a lot of great programs out there that help people, uh, particularly with PTSD, right? But the hard part is, is none of them are holistic. <laughs> none of them really have the capability or ability to, let's say, house a family with two kids under two years old while you're going through that treatment. You know, they put you super nice. They pay for it. They put you in a hotel room, but a, a hotel room with me at the time and then a struggling, you know, mom and two young kids, that's not conducive to healing for anybody. And those things just don't exist because they require resources and time and effort, right? And then also you have all these best and brightest. And you know, in your realm, the doctor realm, like a lot of those places, whether, you know, they're military hospitals or whatnot, you see a lot and you see a lot quick. So it's like the young doctors that go there and build up the resume and then they take off for some mm -hmm. greener pastures, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's hard to find people that actually relate to the experience of trauma in general right? Let alone a family that's been affected by trauma. And I think that's where, you know, for me, them saying, well, how about you go to Pocatello and do these, do HBOT? And I was like, great, another snake oil thing. Like I've had people hold crystals on me. So had you heard about it before then? Or, no. Like when they said HBOT, are no. you like, what? Yes. That's what I was like. And I was like, oh, I've been in a chamber before. Cause like, you know, military chambers yeah. for diving. Yeah in a HAPS chamber for high altitude, yeah. you know, um, operations, stuff like that. I've been in the chambers. I understand, like, what that is. And I also had, you know, I know they're for decompression, you know, when you have dive injuries, guys get in the tank. Um, but I just didn't see any correlation, and it just seemed like, well, this is an experimental thing, you know, like, we're trying it out. And uh, they, honestly, I, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure who did it, but it felt, I'm 100% sure that somebody like organize this kind of information psyop campaign against me. So then all these guys start calling me from all over and all over my history, both in the military and otherwise saying, just do it, man. Just go to the HBOT thing, like go do it. So I kind of gave in and I was again, a reluctant patient. And the first thing I noticed on my first day, cause I had no idea what to expect. And I did two dives daily. So I did my two dives the first day. And the first thing I noticed was I slept huh. like, I slept and that causes a whole other host of problems for me because sleeping, especially at that time was not like a comfortable spot for me, um, mm -hmm. mentally and emotionally. <laughs> um, but I slept, I was tired. But, 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 so, so immediately two dies, which makes sense, right? Yeah. So your, your tissues, your brain is, is having something happen that is, that 
you know, it's different and, and causing changes. But sleep, was that because of the the unknowns of dreams and yeah, just dreams. your unconscious mind being yeah. aware and, and and that's 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 heavy. It was it was hard, right? So again, what an amazing program down there. I love Je- Jeff who runs that program. I know hyperbarics. He's a former salvage diver that like he's doing this on his own. Yeah. Like he's out there. He's in the the wild west of H bot and he's doing it and people go there because he does it right and he cares about people, right? But this is not sanctioned by, you know, by any hospital, at least not when I went there. Um, and uh, so that experience of going through, and I, everyone has their, what they call it, the magic number of dives. I don't know exactly what magic number of dives I could say there was improvement, but I remember at some point, probably in the third week, I know it was the third week, I suddenly got some motivation, like, I'm like, okay, I'm I'm here. I'm away from my family. I'm housed there in this like little apartment they have me in. I'm just doing two dives a day, morning and afternoon, morning and afternoon, morning and afternoon. I'm like, I got to do something. So even though physically I was not, uh, you know, uh, a high performing state at all, I'm like, I'm gonna hike. I'm gonna go do these City Creek trails, and so I do that. And I basically, some reason, my mood started to shift, and it was like, and the reason is H bot. But at that time, I'm like, okay, well, I'm feeling this motivation from somewhere, I'm going to start doing this. You know what? I'm going to go fishing on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, which now I'm like, damn, that'd be nice, right? (laughs) But at that time, that was a big deal for me. And then I remember when I first did it, um, it was very frustrating because my vision was and my dexterity were really affected in the blast. And um, I remember the exact moment. I have a picture of it on my phone. Uh, I was on the Portneuf River near Soda Springs where I drove to and it was snow everywhere and there's a creek and it was the first time I could legitimately tie a fly onto my leader onto my tippet there and that I don't think a doctor in the world would ever give a crap about that that is not anyone's end goal um it wasn't one thing that I even asked for in the PT and the OT and the speech therapy and the vestibular therapy I never thought about being able to tie my a fly back onto tippet but that was the moment that I, like, the first moment since August 16th, 2017, that I actually had hope. Mm. And, uh, you know, I sat in the snow and cried in the middle of nowhere by myself. I took a picture, and I, I was like, okay. Like, it wasn't the silver bullet. It didn't fix everything, but it gave me opportunity when I came back home and places like the Boise VA and all these UCLA, too, like, they – it gave me an opportunity to work on all these therapies and feel good about it. You know what I mean? Like I was actually seeing improvement, whereas before I was just like banging my head against the wall. Talk to me about hope. As a physician, I um, whether listen, we're talking. This is heavy stuff, and you know, big long time thing to get over. And but 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 there are patients that suffer from different things. Mm-hmm. Sure. And a, a source of hope. Um, for you, it was a realization that, hey, I, I could get better. Yeah. What did it feel like? Where did, you know, where did it come from? Talk, talk to me a little bit more about that. I'm looking up a, I love, I love a poem about hope, but keep going. I think it felt, It felt like a release, I guess. It felt like a, a moment where I could actually, you know, when you're looking through like a set of binos or a spotting scope and then you look up, that's what it felt like. Like you gain perspective because you can see everything huh. that's in the tube and then all of a sudden it was like, holy shit, like the world is still here. I'm still in it. I'm able to do this. Like who cares about the fishing or the fly or whatever? It was just one instant that was like, oh my God, like there's improvement that's possible, right? So it's like instant perspective, like, okay, like, okay, I'm here now, so I have to figure things out. Wow. And like I said, I am not in a place where I can say I figured things out, but compared to that place, like, it was life-saving. So listen to this. So this is Emily Dickinson. All right. Um, but it, it goes like this. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore 
must be the storm that keep that could have bashed that little bird that keeps so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity has it asked a crumb of me. I love that because I do think that if there are things that can trigger hope, that somewhere down deep inside there in people, patients, loved ones, family, friends, that lets them, I love your analogy, step back from that scope and, and see perspective. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to watch happen and, and for you to be able to describe it today is powerful probably for, so now I'm gonna flash forward a little bit. You, you have that experience. Dan, now you're like the director over, I mean. <laughs> Bizarro world, right? Certainly. <laughs> Yeah. What so. a story to be able to tell your, the people that, you know, and everyone's path is different, but yeah. to describe hope and how you found it. And then I'm going to brag a little bit about what's happened because, so then you come back from this, I get a call from Joe and he's like, Hey, I need to talk to you, Roger. And I, I, I never know when you go down there. You never know. Did you go down like, okay, what's going on? And he tells me your story. And he is passionate. This guy is like, hey, this works, this saves lives, and I'm gonna figure this out. So this is a few years ago, but now here this summer, uh, down at the campus, uh, the new field house, the campus down yeah. in Park Center, off Park Center, you're gonna have the HBOT Summit Hyperbarics yeah. that I've been blessed to be able to be part of putting it together, where you're gonna have, we're talking world-class multi-chambers, yeah. two of them and bringing people from around the country and diving them with post-traumatic brain injury and PTSD yeah. and having similar results. Again, not approved yet or paid for, mm -hmm. if it were not for, for Joe Scott and his family. I mean, but you're leading it. I mean, Dan, like, well, we, we said Forrest Gump when we started, but this might be better. No. This is, this is, needs to be a movie, dude. I'll tell you one thing. So it was a couple months ago, my dad is a, he was a Navy pilot in Vietnam and he's been in Boise forever, the Forest Service you know, as a pilot brought us up here. Um, and I walked my parents around the campus um, and it hadn't even opened yet. The uh, summit hyperbarics hadn't opened yet and it touched me quite a bit. Sorry. Um, he got really emotional and he's like, look what you built. And it helped like so many people like you. And you know, like dad, it's not my money. It's not my, I didn't do shit. I didn't build this, you know? And uh, he's like, well, your story, you know, influenced these people of power to care. To care in a way they actually put their money where their mouth is in like a big way. And uh, that means even more, you know, that they did this for someone that they didn't know at all, you know, they're just a random guy they heard the story about and they, uh, you know, devote their family's legacy project to helping um, people like me and my guys. And uh, yeah, to say it's humbling is uh, uh, a gross understatement, right? Um, so, and to sit there and say like, you know, I owe my life to the Scott family, to the Alberts Family Foundation, to Mission 43, like it's not blowing smoke. And I think, you know, what's funny is how often we hear that. Um, and I'm sure the Scott family, Jesus, being a part of that family, they probably hear that all the time from all different people. Um, but for me, it's, it is absolute no BS. Um, and that's why, I mean, I, I'll do whatever I can to make the mission go forward and, you know, to do what they want and need me to do and get people in there, um, the right people in there, both veterans and first responders are struggling with TPI, PTSD. And the overlap, as you know, is so, so intertwined. It's hard to break apart what are the symptoms of 
post-concussive syndrome, TBI, like mild TBI, moderate TBI, um, and then post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of it comes from crazy stuff. You know, not everyone that we've treated has been, um, you know, you know, a victim of an IED for lack of a better term, you know, other people, but like if you're, especially if you serve in particular military units, the overpressure that you're exposed to, you know, from things like Carl Gustav's going off next to your head, RPGs, repeated blast exposure, mortars, like all these different things, even if they're outgoing, not just incoming, they all have an effect and rattle your brain, right? So I know the big hotness is CTE for NFL players. Yeah. And that's the thing. You go to programs and they're like, well, you're a TBI unicorn because like, I've had like 23 diagnosed concussions before I got blown up in August yeah. of 17. Now, I did get my bell rung like six days prior to that. So everyone's like, well, maybe it was the proximity because you were already probably concussed when that happened. Well, maybe it's because you were internal to the structure and it was the significance of the blast that did it. Maybe it was just the magic number, the straw that broke the camel's back theory. I don't know. All I know is that I went from being a non-believer in all those effects to my life just falling apart like that and not being able to speak properly not being able to move properly like all this it just all came and it was like this nightmare and fast forward to the hopeful moment and like i said not a silver bullet but um, an opportunity to improve right and it's a constant process and god knows you know <laughs> dealing with that stuff Many people, including me, self-medicate, right? So then we self-medicate with opioids. We self-medicate with alcohol. All these different things to different degrees. And we have all these partner programs to to send people with. And, like, the two, the guy running it now, Brad Blair, is the first person that I put through. He's been through all of them. Mm. So have I. Like Warrior's Heart in Texas, this premier substance abuse facility that's only for first responders and veterans. We send people there, right? And it's because JCAF pays for it. And it's because they pay for guys to run Mission 43. The guy, men and women that run Mission 43 have all been there and done that. Not one of us did not serve in some capacity. Mm -hmm. So they find the right people. They empower us with time and resources to do the right work and send the right people to the right programs through partnerships. And with Summit having our own hyperbaric facility, the best in, in the world. That's in the world. Certainly in the country, if not the world, right? To be able to treat people is remarkable and i think we're just like sitting on this gem like everyone that you have here all your amazing guests that i watch in, that come through here like no one knows yeah. no one knows yet no one knows yet yeah. um yeah and again opening this summer uh i i, I can't wait I, I i get to work there um i don't know how often steve wyman old <laughs> doc dr crusty steve, doc wyman crusty doc wyman's gonna have me working but at least at least once every couple of weeks and i can't wait um I can't wait to just share in um, the experience because there's something really unique about what's going on. It's it's powerful, um, and and the, what's been frustrating from the medical side is, as Steve Wyman and I have really mm -hmm. kind of dug in to try to get Summit set up. Is is I I do believe people know it works. Yeah, <laughs> no one no one wants to pay for it. And I think that's where Joe and the passion is going to go is, hey, our goal. And, and one of the things that he's been true to right from the beginning is I said, hey, Joe, do you want to have this facility be able to take other off-label things? Sure. Because there's hyperbarics that people need for lots of things. And he's like, absolutely not. <laughs> we are mission driven and we're taking care of vets first and we're going to prove that this thing works. And and I think I think he and, and all of us involved are not going to sleep until this becomes uh, a reimbursable, you know, treatment yep. that's going to save, you know, and then all these other places around the, the country can get the service to these people that need it so badly. So you're talking about the medical research component of this, which obviously yes. Mr. Scott and everyone is very, very involved in you as well. Um, you're trying to fight against like the lack of a better term, medical industrial complex yep. that, I mean, I was prescribed many a pill in my yeah. day. I went through many a program, you know, so I think with traumatic brain injury in particular, there's some incentive there to keep people as patients, right? And I, what I love about, yes, perverse incentive, right? Yeah. And and what I love about what he's doing is not only has he built this world-class facility, and, and when I say world-class, I don't think there's anything like in the world with how it's set up, but it does have all the cognitive mm -hmm. evaluations it'll have in pre and post, again, to to gain the data to then be used to hopefully help, you know, this this becomes the 
the thing that then allows more people to be helped. Um, gosh, I, I'm just, I hadn't ever heard the story till today. Well, sorry for crying on your thing here. <laughs> Are you kidding me, Dan? I'm just, I, I don't know if it could be more meaningful than, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know that there's anything else we can do in life that's more important than what we're doing, um, which is helping people uh, like you're doing. And I just can't even imagine. I'm, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm processing your parents and your father as a veteran walking that campus with you. Tell, so you've got the, the hyperbarics building, but then the, the clubhouse, I mean the field house. Talk about that facility. It's, it's, yeah. it's just mind-blowing. Well, what's mind-blowing is that, you know, JCAF, they invited in all these adaptive athletes. They invited in my wife. They invited in all these other veterans like me that had similar experiences. And they're like, well, what do we do and what do we not do? You know, and it's like the whole campus is designed, like I said earlier, like a lot of the great programs, they're beautiful and they have lots of fancy buildings and stuff. But if you fill it up with people who don't understand, that's problem one. Problem two is if it's not designed for the whole family. And I mean, like, recovery is not an individual sport. Like, your family is going through all this, too. You know, if you're in a spot like I was, man, I'm still dealing with ramifications. My family is still dealing with ramifications of me at that time and me still, basically, from that trauma, right? So you, you need to have things in place to keep them safe, comfortable, engaged, you know? And you need people that can think that way as well. So you're not just thinking like, oh, you have two new kids. Like, oh, well, we'll get you, you know, airplane tickets for them too. Well, it's like, hey, you're going to need car seats while you're in Los Angeles for three months. You know what I mean? Just all these stupid things that yeah. unless you've been there, you don't know. And the, and the last thing is like the, the holistic part of it is like access to, I hate to say recreation, but physical activity. Right. So like the field house has, you know, a lot of it. some people you look at it and like, oh, it's a gym. And then you look at other parts of it and it's like, oh, it's a commercial kitchen and a restaurant or it's a beautiful meeting and event space. And it's like, ah, no, no, no. But yes, to all three, you know, there's lodging on site that's, you know, modular. So we can house a family by itself where they have their own private space with multiple rooms or we can house a bunch of people, you know, with like a, a Paralympic hockey team comes in, you know, like stuff like that. We could house them like teams like to be housed, you know. Um, there's a lot of options, and we don't even know. And I know you probably heard that a million times. We don't know everything that the field house is going to entail. But we do know, you know, the spirit behind it and the people behind it, so I guarantee you it's going to be good. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It, it, it's, uh, I, the only other thing I'm sitting here thinking about when I'm talking to you because, um, you know, I – I, I tell people that well, we had Brian on and I told him this. So I took care of Joe's grandma. Yeah. So when I first came to town, I was an ER doc. I did all night shifts. And for whatever reason, I had the luck of taking care of her, mm -hmm. the f good fortune of taking care of her multiple times and spent a lot of time with her and her doctor, which who was J.W. Smith. He was a cardiologist here in town. But one of the, just if, if you think about the country doc, who would be there the second you needed him? That was him, and so sitting in a room with her and him, and and I think about legacy, um, and and you know what the Albertsons family means to Idaho, and and you think about what happened and the story and and all of that. But then I, I think I I go to Joe, <laughs> you know, and 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 his family, um, Jamie and and Brian. Um, they don't have to do this. No. I. They don't have to do this. I ask myself why they come into work every day. I mean, honestly, they could do whatever they want, and not only do they just offer opportunities that don't exist in other communities. I grew up here. Like, I walk by their building all the time, not ever knowing who is inside yeah. of it, because they never draw attention to themselves. It's, it's so quiet. I use the Whitewater Park that they gave us. My kids are on the pump track yeah. at the bike park road skate park all these things i had no idea who was behind it i had no idea well i'm just sitting here thinking of how proud joe's grandma would be if she could if she could have a glimpse into your story and what you've said today and then dan listen like over the next 
hopefully 20 years together, <laughs> whatever it is, buddy, as we watch people come through that field house and they come partake of the hyperbaric treatment there and they, they experience hope and they leave, um, you know, healed with hope and, and yeah. gosh, it's overwhelming. Um, it's just a blessing to be a part of it. Um, thank you so much. No, thank so you for much. having me, Tom. I appreciate it. And then uh, I get to see you Friday and the role reversed, right? You'll be asking the questions. I'll be there. <laughs> I love you, man. Love uh, you too. Thanks, Tommy. And I guess the only thing I'll say when I leave, I'll, um, I love this idea of live a life as an American worth dying for. Wow. What a gift. Thanks, man. Love you. Thanks. Appreciate it.